Welcome everybody to our interview talk with today's topic, Smart City, Intelligent Urban Planning is Digital. Feel free to participate and ask your questions in the chat. This is very important that you really interact with us, that you join us and we will cover your questions and um, at the end with the expert and they will answer them later. So. Let me introduce myself. I'm Denise Wenzel. You might know me from the Intergeo Expo and Conferences, where I and my team, we are from Team Intergeo Communication and Marketing. And we are very pleased that you join us today on this very hot Friday afternoon. So um, I'm delighted to have also these three experts with me who are each passionate about urban digitization in urban planning in their own fields. So before I introduce the speakers, I would like to introduce the topic with a few words. We live in the century of cities. The influx into metropolises continues worldwide. Climate change is accompanied by the need to massively reduce climate-relevant carbon dioxide emissions. The influx of people into cities poses a major challenge for urban planning. The tasks for city administrations are becoming increasingly complex and tools and methods are often still based on traditional static approaches and involve only a limited number of citizens and stakeholders in relevant decisions. So let's talk about digital and intelligent smart city planning with these experts. Please welcome Professor Dr. Gesa Zimmer from the Hafen City University Hamburg. Welcome. We can right now see you on the screen. Please also welcome Professor Dr. Volker Kors from the Stuttgart University of Applied Sciences. Very warm welcome. And Dr. Gerhard Schrotter from the city of Zurich in Switzerland. Perfect. We can all see you right now. So, first of all, we start with three individual talks and move into the discussion in the last quarter of the talk. And please, once again, to all our participants today, feel free um, to ask your questions in the chat. We will cover them at the end and the experts will, of course, answer them later. So, first of all, we start with Zurich and Dr. Gerhard Schrotter. Perfect. Very welcome. He is the director of geomatics and surveying at the city of Zurich. In Zurich, he focuses on digital transparent urban planning and development with the help of a three dimensional digital twin of the city. Wow, we can see right now the digital twin. Perfect. And um, um, his statement is to meet the demands of urban planning today and tomorrow, we need the digital and, as he calls it, responsive city. So Dr. Gerhard Schrotter, or Gary, <laughs> we read that word uh, below your um, video. Um, yeah, we are curious about the digital approaches in the city of Zurich, and we are um, very curious to right now to get to know your approach. Please start with your introduction. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. I'm very happy to present uh, the digital twin of the city of, uh, of Zurich. Uh, my name is normally Gerhard Schotter, but since I moved uh, to Switzerland, I'm, I'm Gary. So uh, in Switzerland, normally you, you are called Gary or uh, in a cute version. So that's the reason I'm called Gary Schotter in, in, in Switzerland. I just, I, I want to talk about the digital twin. And for me, uh, this first uh, picture or this fir first image is, is very, very important because we see here a point cloud. We see a point cloud of the city of Zurich and we see not only the train station, how it looks like from above, but of course, uh, we, also see, we also see the underground. So for me, that's the key point in a, in a digital twin. We have to focus for, for urban planning, uh, not only on above ground, but also on, on the underground, which is a very, very important uh, aspect to We use here a point cloud visualization because for us, it's a possibility to show in a transparent way what is above and what is underground and combine it together into a digital twin. Later on, I will, I will give a sh some short views about what a digital twin is, but 
now I just want to go on to this to this picture, uh, this picture we have since I, I think 20 or 30 years uh, in, the, in the field of, of, of geomatics. And it's all about uh, physical space and digital space. Um, and the digital twin helps uh, to bring uh, the physical world, so the world uh, we are living in, into the digital world, where we can ask certain kind of questions, certain kind of what if questions. And I think the digital twin, like it was before, this 3D city model, which of course still exists, is very important for the what if questions. And the digital twin is the key for simulations. So if we see something in physical space and we want to do simulations and we want to bring that information from the digital space back then we in the physical space again. And for me, that circle normally is an infinite design because it never ends. If we build something in the, in the, in the urban space, we have to digitize it again and, and see how, how we can make it better and bring it back into the physical space. For the digital twin itself, for the, for the definition, that circle gets faster and faster. So we will have sensors that will bring in, I never call it real-time data, I always call it just-in-time data. Because for me, it's important to understand if there is a certain kind of question, we have to answer that question with, with just-in-time data. It doesn't help to always uh, have every month a new 3D city model, new buildings. It helps just to bring certain kind of information in just-in-time into the digital space where we can do the analysis. There are... Just one application uh, I want to show. It's a, today. It's a it's a very very hot day. I think we have 30 degrees here in, in in Zurich, and there are two beautiful publications. One publication is uh, from the city of Zurich. It's called Fachplan und Hitzeminderung. It's all about an action plan how to cool down the city, how to cool down different uh, hotspots that have been figured out in the city, and there is an another beautiful publication outside of the city of Zurich, which is a reflection to the publication of the city of Zurich for architects. So on the one hand, we have about 200 pages of packed information and digital twin scenarios. And on the other hand, we have a reflection from outside, from Hochbader for architects to make it better understandable uh, for the public. Um, Normally, I would show a movie now, and I will try to show some <clears throat> sequences of that movie. I hope you can, you, can, you can see that. I just want to give some short snapshots of that movie and explain again the physical and uh, the digital space and the scenarios we are working in the, in the digital space. And uh, the video will be then on my uh, Twitter account, so you can also uh, download that video and take a look. It's about two and a half minutes. And there are, we have figured out about 13 uh, different uh, test areas in Zurich, uh, public spaces. That's the so-called Bullinger Platz in Zurich. And uh, that space is about 4,200 square meter. And it, it's like a floor heating system. Because inside of that space, of course, you have a very small uh, water fountain. Uh, but outside, there are not much trees, not much uh, vegetation. And of course, there are cars but it should be a place where people meet and uh, people exchange uh, ideas or, or information. And um, I just want to show that it's important then to bring that space, this is just an example here, inside of the digital world, like I showed before. We're using different uh, sensor data. We're using data from uh, airborne uh, LiDAR. We're using data from uh, mobile mapping from streets. We have done a campaign for the 700 kilometer uh, street space and public space in the city of Zurich uh, with mobile mapping. And we make a fusion of that. And for us, it's very important to have a certain kind, to have an attractive visualization of that so we can talk about it. So it's not an, a visualization uh, where you have to be a real expert uh, to talk about it. So in a visualization where different stakeholders uh, can take part. For us, it's also very important, like I said before, for the integral planning to also have a <clears throat> representation of the underground. And if you want to plan 
plant a tree in the city of Zurich, it's a huge project because a tree itself, for example, to cool down that space needs a lot of space in the underground. So, and also for the so-called sponge city uh, or sponge place or sponge uh, street uh, concept, you need to have a bigger space in the underground so the water can be there and can be used when it is a hot day like today. And then you see here, for example, we have for the whole city of Zurich, uh, a utility map. We have a 3D uh, utility map for different projects and we visualize that. And then we look, for example, that's the situation at the moment. It's the so-called PET at 2 p.m. Then we do certain kind of simulation, which I showed before. There are certain kinds of action plans which have been introduced, what I introduced in the Fahrplan und Hitzeminderung before in that publication. And we try that different scenarios in digital space. For example, like here. So we are, we are trying to plant a certain kind of trees there. Try to figure out uh, if those trees have, have any kind of uh, um, uh, interference with the underground, so with different pipelines, is it possible or not? And out of that, we have a good uh, discussion base uh, uh, to move on in the collaboration in the city of Zurich. As I said before, uh, this is just now a, a, a visualization, but we've, we found out uh, that if we do it in that way, and if we do that uh, simulation and scenarios in digital space and bring it back to reality, it's very important to have a close to uh, a reality image again, so we can talk with uh, different stakeholders about that. As I said before, that uh, will be published on my uh, Twitter account. And I just have a few more seconds left. Uh, I just want to want to give a, a small, it's like a meta, meta document about a different uh, different publications I made and different uh, projects I'm working in. One is uh, the digital twin of the city of Zurich for urban planning. There are a lot of uh, applications there, which are shown. Then um, I'm working for a Singapore ETH center uh, for the digital underground of, of, of Singapore, which is a close cooperation with the city of Zurich. And uh, as I said before, all that information and links and also the information about uh, or that movie can be downloaded on my on my Twitter account. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Gary, for these impressions of the city of Zurich and uh, your uh, digital twin um, model. Um, so. I would like to start with the first question. So um, as we just could uh, see, uh, the digital twin is at the center of a smart city strategy for you. So what is the digital twin in your definition and uh, what does it achieve? And so also where is the difference to the uh, 3D city model? Yeah, for that question, I would like to share my screen again, if that is possible. Um, just prepared small uh, document for that. Mm -hmm. Can you see it now? It's, yes, yes. Um, we have discussed a lot about uh, what's the difference between a 3D city model and the and the digital uh, twin for the city of Zurich, and we came out as I said as I said before, it's always different. So if you talk about smart cities, you always have to adapt it for different cities. So that definition is for the city of Zurich, but maybe it can be adopted for other cities too, but it's just for us to have a clear clear mind what's the difference between a Sweden city model and a digital twin. And uh, what you can see here, that blue part here in that graph or in that image, that's the digital twin of the city of Zurich. And it consists of uh, building information data and it consists of 3D geodata. And this is very much different uh, to other definition, definitions because we are just focusing on the data part. We are not focusing on any kind of platforms. We are focusing <clears throat> just on the data part and we want to find out for the data, what is the digital twin. So the digital twin is uh, building information data plus 3D uh, geodata. And um, the 3D city model itself, um, 
what is in, in what is in our description is a model for the whole city. So if we have, for example, the uh, utility map, if you have buildings, if you have trees, and if this is consistent for the whole city, we call it 3D city model. But if you do a certain kind of project where we have different sensors involved, where we have uh, different 3D information, which is not fully uh, fully available for the for the whole city of Zurich, we call it then uh, the digital twin. So for us, it's a really a fusion between the GIS world and the building information world. And what is also very important, that fusion reflects in our organization. So in our organization, we have the so-called uh, GIS uh, city of Zurich, the GIS city of Zurich. And uh, this, this world will, will be now uh, fused together with the building information modeling world. So the organization will be like that, that there will be one steering board that is responsible for the GIS and the BIM de development with different strategies. So that's for us somehow uh, the man to go uh, between uh, Swedish city model and uh, digital twin of Zurich. Okay, thank you. And uh, you you put the three D model online. Is that correct? So you represent a clear open government strategy in Zurich. And um, are there also applications that have been created by third parties who helped or were at it? maybe uh, just one one application there are many many applications uh, there is one a game for example which is very popular it's called reformat set it's a game about how, how Zurich looks in the future uh, and that that game is is it's it's great because it, it uses the footprints and it also uses the 3d buildings of the city of Zurich and introduced it into the, the world of, of gaming there's also another application related to Birdly. Birdly is a, is a way of, of, of understanding, or it's, it's like you can fly really physically with a certain kind of instrument. Yeah, I tested over, that over at Intergeo 2019 yeah. in Stuttgart. Yeah, yeah I, I flew with a Birdly over Zurich. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, oh, cool. that that's also that's also integrated uh, there, and just one application more. There are so many different applications. It's also, if you look at that that uh, publications I've shown before, there are many many architects working, of course, with this 3D information for planning uh, for planning uh, the city of Zurich. Uh, but this is a very nice application because it shows the travel of time. So I will also share those documents. There are always links uh, to certain kind of websites. But here, what you can see from 1850 uh, to now, it's a little bit longer to 2019, I believe. You can see the development of the city of Zurich over time. So there is a time shift here. And then you see how the buildings, uh, how the city grew or which areas of the city grew. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful application. It's done by, by people in the, in the open, open data community. And there will be also a link in the document from many, many different other uh, applications related to the 3D Great. city model. Perfect. And one thing is is very important. If you look at all our geo all our data sets of the city of Zurich for open data, about uh, two thirds of the data sets that are downloaded are geo data, and one third that is downloaded is 3D data. So I think the, the demand for three D data. So one third of all downloads uh, on the geo on, on the on the open data portal of the city of Zurich is related to three D information. So thank you very much, thing. Gary. That was a um, very good oversight and very exciting pictures here of the three D model and that looks like kind of a gamification, which is always very interesting. And right now I would like to head over. Gary we will talk later, but first of all we go to um Professor Dr. Gesa Zima. Um Gesa Zima heads the City Science Lab at Hafen City University, a collaboration with the MIT Media Lab Cambridge, MA USA, that um um, that researches the future of cities. And the City Science Lab at HCU researches the transformation of cities in the context of digitalization with partners from civil society, politics, business, and academia. She also, um, she is also the scientific director of the UNITAG Hamburg Technology and Innovation Lab for the United Nations which focuses on the use of data in informal settlements. And 
her statement or lecture today is about sustainable urban planning is only possible with citizen participation. I think uh, most of us agree. So please, Professor Gesa Zima, we look forward to your, your impulse and very welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for this kind introduction and thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm very delighted to be part of this panel, also to meet all the colleagues. And I was very happy to hear about the Digital Twin in Zurich. We are also setting up a Digital Twin in Hamburg, so we should definitely connect, Gary. Um, I, I, but I don't speak so much about the Twin now here. I come a bit from a different angle. Um, yeah, I'm, um, my title here is uh, Collaboration. So what we do actually is that we build tools, different tools, we call them city scopes that enable people in the city, different stakeholders to speak with each other and to work with each other. So we are trying to foster a collaboration with data. So all our to tools are data based. We map a lot. And I will show you a little bit what we do in, in Hamburg. I don't go so much into, into uh, details um, because we don't have so much time. It's more an overview. And then, like you said at the beginning, I would also bring in a little bit the global perspective because I work for the United Nations and there we work with big, big cities in the global south. And we also have a lot of data challenges when we come to those cities. So I'm heading actually two labs. I'm, I'm a, lab, a lab person. And the one is the City Science Lab. It's a cooperation with MIT Media Lab in Cambridge. And uh, this is a very typical situation um, in my daily work. Um, we, we have this, we call them city scopes. So they are interactive um, tables. You can do scenario planning, like Gary also said this, uh, what if? And this is also a question that we ask ourselves very often at work. What happens if we took all private cars from the city centers? What happened if? whatever, we, we build more bike lanes and so on and so on. And in our case, those tools are interactive. We also work with analog material like Lego bricks or, or other material so that people who come to our lab really have to work on these maps and on these tables. And it's, it's GIS based, of course. Um, actually, it's, it's, it's about mapping. Um, and we always try to, um, to enable collaboration between the citizens. So we really organize citizen engagement processes. So really citizens come to our lab and work with us, but also stakeholder engagement. We work a lot with experts, urban planners. And of course, we also try to connect science and industry um, to, to the dialogue of uh, planning um, the city for the future. I give you a very brief example. The first big project we did was finding places, which was quite uh, quite interesting. Uh, years ago, five, four or five years ago, you all remember that so many refugees came to Europe, also to Hamburg. We took approximately 40,000. And it was not so much the number of people who came, it was, it was more the speed because they came very, very fast. The city administration had to put all those people in tents because we didn't have empty spaces. So and, and I, I will never forget that image. So the whole city was um, full of tents and people had to stay there, had to sleep there. Then the mayor called me and he said, can we set up a citizen engagement process and speak with the citizens of Hamburg about how, where to distribute all those people? And then we set up um, a map of the city of Hamburg. We um, visualized all public spaces and spoke about um, distributing all those people for the next few months and years. So this was only about temporary housing. This project was not about integrating them, integrating them in a long-term perspective. It was more about where to put all those people so that they can stay clean and safe. It was really a, a kind of emergency situation. This was the tool. This is how it looked like. So you could speak about the city at different scales, like you had a kind of the whole city, then you had the district scale, and then you had a neighborhood scale. And people who came to our lab, they were citizens, normal citizens. We took them as local experts for the city and asked them, what do you think? Where are public spaces where we could build a temporary accum accommodation? So they could work with these bricks and you see here this frame um, to speak about uh, their ideas of or empty spaces uh, of the city where we could then uh, put the people. At the end, it was a long process that took five months. Uh, we screened the whole city of Hamburg and we had a lot of results. We found a lot of empty spaces like parks or sport areas or also parking areas unusual places that a city planner from um, from a uh, perspective that is more 
a distance that sometimes uh, doesn't know. From this project, uh, we have we developed another one, which is the digital participation system. I mean, you have this in other European cities too, uh, so people can comment on a lot of um, city planning issues like housing, new forms of mobility, and so on and so on. Everything is also open source. In our case, we have a very strict um, open source policy, a transparency law, which is very important for us, it makes us very easy uh, to work. And at the moment, we are setting up a new tool that I like a lot, and that is very, very well accepted by, by experts. This is a planning tool, not for, um, for, for citizens, it's really for experts. We call it COSI, Corporate Social Infrastructure. It's a web platform for working with social infrastructure data in combination with uh, urban data. So um, it's a tool for data relations. Um, it's like we have a master portal, of course, and the, uh, the planner can access data in real time or in runtime. This is important. And it's uh, closely developed with a lot of different stakeholder groups uh, from the city of Hamburg. <clears throat> and here you can see a little bit uh, some, some uh, detailed information about it. We work at the moment with about approximately 64 indicators like population area, households, and so on and so on. We map this also in time series for presenting trends. Actually, what Gary uh, showed us with the city, how the city looked like, the building, this is a bit what we do with the social data. Huh? We map them also in this time uh, series so that you can see uh, what about the schools, what about the kindergartens, did they get more or less? And um, it's a lot about supply analysis. So um, how many playgrounds do we need per child or accessibility, accessibility analysis? Uh, we did all the COVID test centers now. <clears throat> How can we access them in a very uh, only few minutes? And also, we, we we are able to compare a lot of areas, uh, like um, population population density, for example, compared with another district in regard of population population density. So, um, COSI is is well accepted, and it's it's something that will really grow. And we would also integ integrate this to. A, the twin and just one sentence to the digital twin. In our case, we have an urban data platform. We have all those tools that I showed here very quickly. And we are going to integrate all those tools now to the digital twin to have then more a centralized way of um, putting all this data in there and also visualizing and also modelizing and um, creating scenarios. Okay, so then uh, UNITAC, just a few sentences. Um, as I said, we are now setting up a kind of a lab, which is more or less the same that we have done for Hamburg now for many years for the United Nations. They discovered our lab in a way, and they said that they want this also too, but for a global perspective, for working with us in uh, cities in the global south. It calls UNITAC, and we follow the goal number 11, sustainable cities and communities or regions. And yeah, when, when we speak about uh, cities from a global perspective, then of course the, the, the challenges are a little different. More than 20% of mankind lives in informal settlements. So we have very basic requests like, for example, mapping, setting up urban data platforms. Also, a lot of cities need a lot of participatory um, e-government systems, like they also want to speak to the citizens. Democratic governments uh, know that top-down planning doesn't work also in, in those cases. And uh, of course, co-designing um, co tools. And uh, we do work a lot also with augmented reality, virtual reality, so that you can dive into the city in another way and see more rooms or spaces, public spaces uh, in another way. So I would say that I stop here. <laughs> Maybe we can go a little more in detail uh, in the following discussion. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gisa Zima, for presenting these platforms for um, collaboration and also uh, here the project of UNITAC. And um, I would like to start with the first question. Um, so, um, yeah, you just um, explained that collaboration is so elementary in urban planning. And uh, just um, give us an example how the actors find each other um, when you plan, when you do those um, platforms and plannings. Yeah, I, um, we have different, different cases, of course. I mean, when we do a citizen engagement, then it's an open call. No? We, we just open calls and people can just um, enroll 
with a website very easily to us. They can uh, register and then they can come to our lab and work with us. So that's that's very easy and it's easy. It's very open. More interesting is maybe the quest your question in regard of, of the stakeholders. And we have a very, very close relationships to the different authorities in the city of Hamburg. So very often we get direct requests from them. So it's really often that the mayor or the estate secretary or someone calls us and say, look, I want, I would like to have a map on um, mobility, on certain issues on mobility. Can you do this? I would like to send you all my employees because they have to plan this in a, in a way. So it's, it's for us, we don't, we don't have to find them. <laughs> Usually they come because we get, um, we have our collaboration, um, our workflow is so closely connected to the authorities that then we have all the stakeholders on board. And what I really would like to underline is the most important thing is interdisciplinarity. It's, it's very banal, but we, it happens so often that people meet in our lab in front of those tables and maps from different authorities and they have never seen each other before. And this makes a lot. <laughs> People start to speak to each other. And the finding places was very, very crucial in regard of this because refugee accommodation, it's about finances, it's about education, it's about health, it's about everything, spaces. So this was really great that all those people met, they had to meet. It was a kind of, like I said, emergency situation and that um, helped setting up a better workflow between the authorities. Perfect. So bringing science into practical world, uh, in the, into the practical world, as you just uh, explained, is a very important thing. And you do it uh, with uh, the uh, kind of labs or just explain us, you, you just called that the authorities are in front of your door. And so do you have tools to bring those platforms from science into practice? Yeah, I mean, all those tools that we are setting up, like the DPAS tool, the COSI tool, also the Finding Places tool, they are all um, implemented to the city. So it's we also do um, basic orientated um, research. No? It's not that we, but we our research is very much applied. So all those tools run. They are all open source. The codes are all on GitHub. And we always try to set up also a coding community around those tools when we when we um, deliver them. We just did this with a deep pass. We organized a big conference. We invited all the cities in, in Germany. In this case, this was a national project. And then we um, uh, tried to, to set up also a coding community. And we are now, for example, adding to this DPAS tool um, um, participatory budgeting project. So what we call Bürger budgets in German. This is also a big issue in a lot of European cities. And this is good for us to know that there is already a coding community around it now. They are trying to set up this. And um, it's, it's like a community work at the end. Okay, very interesting. And the other thing uh, you just um, had in your short overview was UNITAC. And uh, this is because you work as a UN consultant and deal with urban planning there in the global south. And um, Yeah, we just saw that, that you focus on informal settlements, so where a quarter of humanity lives. So what are the challenges there compared to cities like Hamburg, for example? Yeah, it was quite interesting. We uh, this, we set up this lab at the beginning of this year, so it's, it's uh, still quite new. And we opened a call some weeks ago for the whole world. So all countries could apply at UNITAC for technical support or for their needs in regard of um, collaboration, data collaboration. And that was quite interesting. Um, first thing was they all need open data infrastructures. They all need a good data management system, a good urban data hub, otherwise you cannot deliver service to your people. Then mapping is the other very, very um, crucial issue. When we speak about informal settlements, sometimes we even don't know how many people live there. We don't know how do they organize water access, education. So there is a huge lack of, for especially qualitative data, but also quantitative data, both. So mapping, then the dialogue tools. And, and I found it so interesting to see that people in Nepal and in Cambodia and in Brazil, they want to have the same, like, um, um, communication tools between government and citizens like we do it here in Europe. There's no no difference. Then planning tools, as I said, and of course, what also is very um, requested are monitoring tools. So like monitoring, for example, resilience factors for 
countries or monitoring the SDGs, for example. So monitoring systems, this is something that a lot of, um, a lot of countries really need. So this will be the, the topics or the tools that we are going to work on with UNITAC for the future. Perfect. Thank you very much, Geza Zima, for sharing this overview about your platforms and your work in science with us about um, smart city planning. And we would like to continue with our third speaker in this panel um, today. And after that, we will do the talk with all speakers, as I already mentioned. But right now, I would like um, to welcome our third guest, who is Professor Dr. Volker Kors. And Volker Kors studied computer sciences at the TU Darmstadt. And and did his doctorate in computer graphics. And since 2002, he has been professor of computer science and geoinformatics at uh, the Institute or University of Applied Sciences, Stuttgart. And uh, his research focuses on 3D spatial data infrastructures and the visualization of spatial data. Um, his big topic or his topic today with his overview is the use of 3D city models in the energy transition. And his statement is 3D city models paved the way to carbon dioxide neutrality of cities. This is very interesting. So the next four minutes go to Volker Kors. Welcome. Yes, thanks for the invitation to this interview talk. I appreciate it a lot. Um, now, next slide. Okay. Um, as, as you mentioned, um, um, I would, Say focus on on the the just mentioned the statement. How can we from say geoinformatics and with data contribute to this global challenge of um, climate change and especially carbon neutral cities? Um, because that's an worldwide, from my point of view, the uh, maybe. Pandemic is a, uh, another challenge as well, but the climate change is a big one. And it's difficult to deal with that because you don't see the, the, the results or the, the changes. It's not so obvious yeah, because it's long-term changes. Um, but on the other hand, uh, um, last week, the, uh, um, Munich Security Conference shared their new um, security monitor. That's a document they deliver every year and to, to evaluate or assign the most um, security issues perceived by the citizens worldwide. And in Germany, number one, number two are climate change and extreme weather um, events based on climate change not pandemic, what I was assuming. <laughs> so that's really a um, big challenge. And here's um, the, I would call it a 3D city model. Uh, it's not a big city, it's, it's a rural area in, in Landkreis Ludwigsburg next to Stuttgart. Um, we use our tools we have developed on urban um, heat demand simulation, etc., for um, for a climate protection plan of the county of Ludwigsburg, which includes 34 districts that was done some years ago already. But you see here um, clearly, and I think that is um, the same situation um, in every European country, private households or heating of housing um, contributes to 40% of the CO2 emissions. And the second big thing is transportation. Industry, of course, as well, but for cities, they or just by living, <laughs> you have a lot of CO2 emissions. Yeah? Um, and that is something we, um, we, we need to, to change. And here's, um, an example how this can look like. Um, that was a recent study and I moved to the north now, not to the global south, but that was a study we did, um, last year with the city of Helsinki. Um, why? Because from my perspective, Helsinki has a very, very advanced um, 3D city model and digital twin. So not only the geometry, but a lot of additional information also for on, on, on energy demand of households. And in this um, application, you can explore it online. Um, we did some scenario calculations how um, 
different aims of the, um, say, a municipality can be achieved. Um, and one big question is, Helsinki wants to become zero carbon neutral in 2035. Uh, so with, uh, based on the 3D city model and some extra information and climate change scenarios, you can um, simulate um, CO2 emissions in 2035 or heating demand, first of all, and, and 2050, and see which strategies lead to which result. And that is one, for me, one very important use case, this combination, Gary mentioned it in this talk as well, the combination of um, data-driven simulations. So combining simulations and models with data and in, with the 3D model, you have much better representation of the real world. Uh, and in, in, in this example, we used um, the um, different scenarios, a business as usual scenario where you say, okay, if you don't do anything, uh, you have the refurbishment rate of buildings, you have climate change, so winters will become warmer, heating demand goes down anyway. Yeah? So, but the question is, is this relevant and how much <laughs> is it? Yeah? And if you don't take any action, then in Helsinki, um, heating demand will go down to 85% based uh, compared to 1990. Yeah? And that obviously is not sufficient to or it reduces uh, CO2 emissions, but not significantly. And then we did other scenarios like um, district heating, network scenarios, um, refurbishment of 3%, which none of the European cities has, but that's an assumption. And with the combination, you can try which, um, um, say, action has an impact and which combination of impacts lead to your goal. And the, um, the result here is zero carbon from the building sector was not achieved in our simulations, um, but a reduction by over 80% can be achieved mainly in Helsinki with the um, district heating network using renewables because most of the buildings are attached to district heating networks in Helsinki as well. Huh? Um, and as I mentioned, we have the building sector, but we have the transportation sector as well. And this is from me, um, that was an experiment we did together with the city of Stuttgart in a, in a thesis work. Um, this year, or I started last year, um, and results were published this year, um, where we tried to connect the building model, so the 3D model, with transportation data. and. With, with traffic flow data. And this is um, fetched from, um, from, a, from a here API, so from another data source. And we build an interface. We treat this movement, this traffic flow data, as sensor data as well. Yeah? So with this combination and um, coupling the 3D model um, with sensor data from traffic information and collect this data um, over um, over time, we have more or less a real-time map um, of traffic flow in for the major streets, uh, not for all streets, but the, the big ones. And um, based on this, we can um, estimate both CO2 emissions, but also, and that was for us even more interesting, um, noise level, because then we can query, and that is, say, from from um, from my perspective, very big contribution of a digital urban twin in contrast to a city model. Uh, here now we can query um, things like where are the buildings with high density traffic and a low traffic flow, which means traffic jam, yeah, which means noise. And then we can identify buildings in the 3D model to say, okay, but these buildings are most affected by this situation. Um, and that is for me um, 
Ja, it, it's um, this connection of the different sectors, building sector, transportation sector, using a digital twin, having slow changing data like buildings and fast changing data like, it's like sensor data like traffic um, and use both of these sectoral data um, in um, analyzing um, tools to find some interesting correlations and, and things like that. And that is um, for me one of the the key elements and what, what a, um, a smart city um, contributes to, to the entire um, game of, of um, urban planning and predictions. And this is data-driven. Yeah? So for this, you need an urban platform, you need an API, not only data, but an API to access the data, to be able to analyze the data, both slow changing things and fast changing things. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Volker Kors for sharing this presentation about the 3D models, the role of 3D models with us. And uh, as we just could see, it, uh, the 3D model is the heart uh, of the process towards climate neutral cities and um, which kind of data plays a role in there and uh, how are they linked? Could you just explain that to us? Uh, which kind of data for, for, <laughs> would not... You just you said I have four minutes time. Um, so um, for for the simulation, we need the the this three D building model, which is that gives us a volume. Yeah, so we don't heat floors, even though the numbers indicate that, because we always calculate kilowatt hours per square meter. But indeed, it's kilowatt hours per cubic meter. Yeah, we heat areas, uh, we, we heat volumes. So, and the 3D model gives us the volume of the building. It's a, a very, very essential information from my perspective. And of course, we need to have some information about the building height, so which materials have been used, which are the U values of the materials, so we can calculate the um, heat transfer coefficients to see which much heating demand or cooling demand, we do the same studies in Singapore as well, and then heating is zero, but cooling is higher than heating in Europe. Um, so we need to have information about building physics, and this information we usually use based on the so-called building physics libraries that are available in, in Germany by the Institut um, Wohnen Umwelt or in Europe by the Tabula, so these are data sources that are coming from a very different domain, but we can connect it to the to the buildings in, in our simulations. And of course, um, weather and climate information is extremely essential for that. That is also something we need to connect to the city models. Mm -hmm. Also, we use this as a data integration platform in that sense. Okay, thank you. And uh, you just uh, showed us the pictures of uh, and the um, model of Helsinki. And uh, what about other cities? Do you work on that or do you know from them? Yes, we also work together with the city of Rotterdam to do um, similar simulations. Um, and also in some city districts in, in Stuttgart, of course, not for doing the simulation for the entire city, but in specific districts where, are, um, where, where new um, urban designs are ongoing, like um, the, um, the heart of Europe, <laughs> it's called, um, the district. Um, behind the main station in, in Stuttgart, for example. Um, and as I mentioned, we had some case studies in, in Singapore as well. So um, yes, we, we use this and we share the tool as well. So I know other cities um, use our software, it's, it's free software to do, to, to do the um, simulations um, without us, which is fine as well. Huh? Like Valladolid in Spain, I'm aware of the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also heard about uh, the uh, speakers before from Gesat Sima and uh, Gerhard Schrotter that the topic of cooperation and collaboration is very important. And um, so science and municipalities must work hand in hand to bring those city uh, challenges forward. And how do you go about that? We have some, some initiatives and especially since Corona, we were approached, as, as Professor 
Zima just said in Hamburg, the city of Stuttgart should us and to, to help them with public participation process, yeah, because um, it's moves to the digital space. So we use the tools also to set up digital twin um, to um, and add a participation tool to support online participation using the 3D model, try to simplify things visually so you can um, have the, the context and you do not need to read abstract plans, but you get a better imagination by using a 3D visualization plus additional information and the integration of, of questionnaires. So, um, yes, we, we are doing this um, together with the city of Stuttgart. Um, and I think it's, it's essential and it would be even better to have it in a combined way that you can choose the tools um, at specific locations in, in where the planning is, is ongoing, see the reality plus have digital information. Uh, so we, we have a lot of experiments with using augmented reality to superimpose um, the future into the, the reality. But that's at the moment quite hard to do <laughs> for obvious reasons. Okay, so um, Volker Kors, we would like to open this panel again to Geza Zima and uh, Gary Schrotter, um, because we are also like to use that expert swarm intelligent about digital <laughs> urban planning with all our experts today. And um, yeah, this is uh, right now the time to get into discussion, to talk to each other. And also if there are questions uh, in the audience from our participants there, I saw two questions um, for Gary Schrotter. Uh, but first of all, uh, let's start with an input from my side to all the three of you or also to our audience. So um, yeah, the the aim is to find uh, really rapid solutions to the challenges in the areas of living, transport, and the environment in the in the cities. So, what do you what do you have to what do we have to do to advance the digitalization of cities and thus achieve sustainable developments for the benefit of the people more quickly? Because this all seems to me so. There are very good best cases. There are some cities who really move forward, but then there's then you see the news, then you hear. Uh, about um, climate problems, the influx in cities, the refugee problem, and the pandemic situation as we are all uh, still in. Um, there are so many things. Uh, how can we go on um, more quickly? Do you have solutions about that or ideas? What do you think do we need? What are the challenges? Maybe we start with Geza Zima. Yeah, that's a big question, isn't, isn't it? <laughs> This no is why we have you point. today, to we brought you together, <laughs> to bring the solution. <laughs> be able to answer this, but I uh, I think my impression is always there's uh, so much techni technical innovation around. When you go to cities in the world, I mean, Volker, you mentioned Singapore, Helsinki. Those are also our reference cities, of course. We all know the Helsinki model and they are friends and colleagues and so on and so on. But my, my feeling is very often when we work in cities, those um, innovations have to become real. It's, it, the most important thing is that they reach people. <laughs> and uh, sometimes the tools that we set up in our lab, they are not rocket science uh, technical wise. I mean, you work with MIT, we, we experiment a lot, but the ones that we really use then, they are sometimes very simple. Also for the twin, I, I like the this example with the trees that you showed, Gary, because this is super simple. You can plant trees, you can put them away, and then you can measure CO2 reduction. And this is what people can work with. And I also imagine our twin working really like this then at the end. Very, very, like, I, I, I call them simple use cases, but with simple, I don't mean that the challenge is simple. I mean that they are very, very simple to use. They have to be approachable in a very, very a simple way. And uh, this is my, so I'm, I'm not, I don't fight for more innovations. I fight more for uh, bringing these innovations really to the people and set up good workflows with, with the authorities at the end, with the planners, with the stakeholders, and also with the citizens. Yeah. Gary. Hmm. Thank you very much for that, um, for that input. Uh, um, we, just, we just found out in the city of Zurich when we talk about efficiency, I'm always laughing when we talk about participation and efficiency. 
because a city, a city itself, if you want to do participation, for sure you have a, a, a long process with many, many people, different, different people involved, uh, different situations. And, and for, for me, uh, the most important thing is what you have seen in that video now is I would like to bring our ideas closer to people that they understand what we are doing. That's the reason in geomatics, normally when you have a point cloud, everybody says to you, we have a point cloud. We, uh, that's the first product, but we have to move on. We have to move on. We have to move on. No, we don't have to. <laughs> because I think a point cloud itself, especially when you talk about vegetation and uh, you talk about making people understand that the digital twin is above and underground, it's a very, very good tool to discuss because it has a transparent view, very simple. So you can look through, you have an understanding uh, what's going on. And for the simulation process, you can do something else in the digital world, which is not seen. But for me, the key point is really that we are, let's call it faster or being more accepted or having a better quality. The key part is that people understand, different stakeholders understand what we are doing and uh, visualize it in the best possible way. Of course, we're using augmented reality too. But I found out with augmented reality, when you stand with 10 people on a space and you have all that HoloLens is on, it's great to discuss, but the main point is missing. You cannot look each other into the eye. So <laughs> you have, you don't have the communication uh, with each other. So it's, it's very simple again, but technology is great, but we, we have to use it in, 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 in the most simple uh, way. So most simple way on the, on the surface, of course. It, uh, that people accept what we are doing and, and people understand that the digital twin is not a monster in digital space. It's something to help uh, to, to make more attractive places, for example, for, for the city of Zurich to, to, to enjoy. Yeah, and the same question also to Volker yeah. Kors about uh, how to achieve those aims about cl climate neutrality and yeah. things like that in mega cities. Um, I would say we have to be realistic. Yeah, at least I work with data and information. Yeah, that does not change the world <laughs> in that sense. Not the physical space, even though we call it digital twin. If I change something in the digital world, nothing happens in the real world. <laughs> oh, what a pity! <laughs> so we can provide information, um, but someone needs to take action as well to change the the physical space as well. Yeah, that um, that of course is a challenge. I think information is a, a value and can contribute to that. Uh, it's not the solution to everything, but it can contribute. For example, maybe it's a German thing, but in Germany, everyone, almost everyone knows the consumption of few consumption of a car. On it's it's a big thing. Uh, people talk about it. They want to have okay, where can I get the cheapest fuel, etc. Almost no one knows about the energy consumption of a building. And that's the question, why? Yeah? And if, because I think it's more abstract, it's not so obvious, you do not need to fuel it every day. But if we find better ways to, to show this and make it more aware and the consequences, yeah? I think then we already achieved things because that will um, make more people to think about it and um, recognize, okay, I can change something by myself. Uh, I don't need an authority to improve the world, but I can contribute by myself. I think that is essential and here information can help a lot. Mm -hmm. And money as well. <laughs> yeah. But um yeah this is this seems to me we we know about so many technologies and data and solutions and models. We know that from the Intergeo platform where all the exhibitors with their solutions and things uh, present um their technical achievements, their innovations about solving these um, huge problems. But sometimes it seems to me that uh, when you are in, in your daily life, it's just as you mentioned with your example about energy savings in your in your house and so on, but um, gaining money when fueling. Uh, this this is so important to bring it into the, the head and the heart of the people. So is it the politics? Is it the media industry? Is it the municipalities? Is it the schools? Who has to bring those information into people's head and mind? Can I add something, please? Mm -hmm. I think um, um, it's also very important, and we all mentioned this a little bit, un, uh, not, not, not so specific maybe, to connect citizen, 
citizen data to the tools that we are creating, like the city or the university or whoever, because citizens, they, they produce a lot of data. I mean, sensors are getting cheaper and cheaper. You can put them on your backpack, drive with your bike to the city, and then can collect data about air quality, for example. And this is also a challenge for us. Having We have to have the state agencies. That's very important. They host the data. They look that the data is in good quality. They set up master portals. This is very, very important. Standardization and so on and so on. But Connecting citizen data to those centralized data, this is also one of the most important things. And this creates at the end also acceptance, like you said, and also awareness of data production. Okay. Anybody has something to add for what uh, Geza just said? Yes, I totally agree with, with that. And there's the technical solutions already exist from my Point of view, yeah, we, we went with, with this Luftdaten info yeah. that is a citizen initiative from, from Stuttgart and we provide the data using sets of things API. Um, but of course, you need to organize this as well. Yeah? It's not only the technical solution, but you need to talk to the people. And, um, yeah, um, also to, to the, to the, um, citizens yeah, they, that in, in this case it's a small group of retired people very enthusiastic um, but of course you need to um, um, they have a process also to to integrate their work in, into such a um, such a platform uh, that's not happening by itself and you cannot ask for too much from the, the volunteers mm -hmm. And um, we just talked about the city. What about the rural areas? Um, do we also have to bring more digitalization and smart planning in there? And there will be then many more opportunities. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, Volker. May I start with a short answer from, from this energy transition? The rural areas have a big advantage and um, we have um, also several um, projects with, with um, small cities or rural areas. And in most cases, if you want to change something in your energy system, more renewables, it requires, or it simplifies things if you have space. And the rural areas usually have the space. So for them, it's much easier to, to work with uh, and contribute to, to these things. Uh, so I think the hard part are really the, the dense cities. Mm. I think, Geza, you also showed that from the UNITAC project. Uh, you, you mentioned that the need of the people there is the same. And uh, yeah. Yeah, um, I think but what, what you said, that's very important that we connect the rural, rural areas to the city areas. And in the post-pandemic times we are living in now, I think work will change also. People will work more at home. So density will be different now. It is already, you can see this already in cities. So the connection between the rural cities and the city, this is an issue that we should take care of. And we should uh, collect common data. In Hamburg, we call this in the metro metropolitan region. I mean, the city is 1.8 million. And when we speak about Hamburg, we actually data-wise always speak about 5 million. So we always try to already try to do this. And we are also try to transfer our tools, of course, to rural regions. But this should be taken into account much more. Um, did you see in the chat, Johanna Fleischer had a question to all of you um, regarding the point of interdisciplinarity. In the presentation, I saw two aspects, the simulation strongly related to material and one approach giving solutions to inform transfer between users, planners. Shouldn't a twin also exploit the possibility of combining these approaches and how could that look like? I guess it was the presentation of uh, Volker. Yeah, maybe I can um, start with uh, with two answers. One technical answer is in the, in the concept in uh, digital um, twins. We had a very nice um, meeting organized by the OGC early this year um, with an international forum on people that build 
technology for digital twins. And there was more or less a consensus that there is not one digital twin, but there will be domain-specific digital twins that need to be connected. Yeah, so we have an energy digital twin and a water digital twin, and we do not need to do the connection or the details, but on some, say, higher level, there need to be connections between these, these different digital twins. Um, and how to organize this is, of course, also people. So at, at our um, at the HFT, we have a, a protocol called ICT or Intelligent City, where we work with an interdisciplinary team with um, and building physics, urban planners, architects, geospatial people. And I think this is also, um, you have to bring together people that are willing to work uh, together. Mm. Yeah. Gary, if you um, if you do one project in the, in the city of Zurich, for example, or in, in an administration, you always uh, work together with many many different stakeholders. So uh, this one example of planting a tree involves so many different experts, and there are so many questions related. For example, just plant one tree in the city that you always need to have a collaboration with each other and you need to have those those platforms and uh, that information that, that people understand what you're talking about. That's the reason I said before, if you want to do it collaboration, you have to find a way to visualize it in, a, in, a, in the most, in the easiest way and understandable way and more closest to reality. It's very similar to a picture so that, uh, that, that people, that people um, uh, understand that. I think this you have always for, for any kind of task, for any kind of situation you want to plan or you want to change something in a city, you have a huge amount of different stakeholders and uh, collaborations uh, you, you, have to, you have to bring uh, together. About that a situation of many or how many digital twins, that's a long, long discussion I had with many, many different people. So what is the digital twin? Do we have a plural version of it? We have digital twins. So if you have a house, for example, it comes mostly also from building and construction business where it is in the building information and modeling world. Uh, the term of uh, a digital twin for a house, for a whole house was introduced. But of course, you can challenge it down and say every different uh, port or every different glass or every different uh, Part of a, of a house, for example, is a digital twin of something else because it can have a sensor involved. So, for us at the city of Zurich, it was somehow clear that we we say it's it's the digital twin. We call it the digital twin of the city of Zurich with different components. And those those components, we don't go too deep into detail. We say, for example, one topic could be the traffic, one topic is the vegetation, one topic uh, buildings. So we don't want to go too far into that detail, but uh, for sure there will be a lot of uh, different uh, digital twins appearing. And one more aspect to all those different tools, I mean, for us, for us at the City of Zurich, what we are trying to find out now is a certain kind of standardization process for, for different data sets. So we have that geo server where different organizations uh, can share their data. We want to extend like I showed in the in the one graph before, we want to extend that geo server, and we are starting with very similar data set with just points. <laughs> so we are starting with three D points. Uh, we are starting to build a point cloud server, uh, where different organizations can work with different point clouds because we found out that everything else we are doing above those point clouds uh, brings in totally new standards uh, and, and totally new ideas of how the geometry, for example, could, could, could look like. And the other challenge is, of course, also then to share all that building information modelings that are already around from architectural competitions, for example. Of course, we want to share them too inside the city organization. So for me, that data, the data part is, 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 is really, really important that we have a, a clear mind of making it not too complicated and uh, trying to find out an essential essential part then that we can share inside of the of the organization thank you very much we are at the end of our one hour talk um, smart city intelligent urban planning is digital i would like to thank the audience for your attention and of course this very interesting panel of um, smart city 
planner, urban planner expert, <laughs> very enthusiastic and engaged. And it was very interesting to bring us a uh, short overview about your ideas, platforms, solutions, insights. And uh, I guess uh, we could continue for another half hour, but right now this hour is over. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, please, uh, if you are still interested in Intergeo or the topics of Intergeo, follow Intergeo on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, yeah, it's just uh, the next event will be in August. It will be announced here on LinkedIn and on at the Intergeo website. And uh, so at the latest, we will see us in September at the Intergeo Life and Digital Hanover. And uh, this is from the 21st to the 23rd of September. And um, thank you and bye-bye.